When dry eye symptoms keep coming back, inflammation might be to blame. Over-the-counter eye drops can provide temporary relief. Zydra can provide lasting relief. It targets inflammation that can cause dry eye disease. Zydra treats the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. Don't use if you're allergic to Zydra. Common side effects include eye irritation, discomfort or blurred vision when applied, and unusual taste sensation. Why wait? Ask your doctor about a 90-day prescription and pay as little as zero dollars. Zydra. My life's been really filled with great moments and great places, and, and those are what I remember. Yes, y'all, and Kevin Costner is too blessed to be stressed, and that is evident in his thoughtful approach to his life and his career. Look at that smile on his face. We leave you now with more of Kevin in his own words. I was Take care, y'all. Night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Happening now. A couple's dispute ends at the barrel of a gun. A man is dead, a woman in the hospital. I'll tell you what neighbors believe was at the root of this. It's an easy way to save money buying things on Facebook Marketplace, but it can also be an easy way to get scammed. So coming up, some ways to protect yourself. Changes are taking place. You'll notice and feel them this upcoming Easter weekend and another cold front is on the horizon. All the details in a bit. The News at 5 starts right now. But first at five, a developing story in Converse. A man is in critical condition after a shooting there. The police department confirmed it happened this afternoon on Meadow Hill. All right, Avery Everett joining us now live. Avery, you spoke with neighbors who heard this shooting happen. Lee Dillon, this is still a very active scene. Police are searching this street here in Converse where they say a shooting happened just hours ago. And from where we're standing, it looks like police are searching two different vehicles. I'm gonna take a step outside so that you can get a closer look. There's a Navy truck and a white SUV with their front hoods and doors open. It looks like one of the windows on the white car is shattered. Just under that is what looks like a rag or clothing with blood on it. And there's also a pair of shoes. But police only confirmed to us that a man was shot and is now at the hospital in critical condition. So we did ask the police about if there is any suspects or what might have happened leading up to this shooting, and they weren't able to provide us with any additional information at this time. They say they're going to email us a detailed statement in the coming hours, and as soon as we get that, we'll keep you posted on KSAT.com. Dylan Lee. But live for us in Converse, thank you, Avery. New at 5, marital problems appear to be at the center of a shooting. San Antonio police are calling an attempted murder and suicide. They say a man shot and wounded his wife, then killed himself. As Katrina Weber reports, the neighbors knew all about the couple's problems. Lights flashing against the night sky on Champlain Drive near Nacogdoches Road quickly drew attention from neighbors. They could tell right away there was trouble. What they didn't know was how serious it was. Then my kids raised the bed, and I had the window open at the time, and I saw the, all the commotion. Katie Hatter says she saw police officers, some with guns drawn, moving toward the house next door around 7.30 last night. I was hoping everything was okay next door. Um, I saw the woman come out and went to the ambulance. Um, I hope she's okay. Police say that 51-year-old woman on the stretcher was critically wounded in a shooting. They believe the woman's husband, identified as 52-year-old Miguel Sauceda, shot her, then killed himself. Police say one adult and one minor child escaped and called for help. Despite the commotion that unfolded here, no one who I talked to heard the gunshots. They told me they were surprised when they saw police show up. Neighbors say what was not surprising was that the couple had been having marital problems. They say the husband, who had been a friendly, helpful neighbor, recently became troubled. My boyfriend went over there and talked to him to see if everything was okay, and he was talking to him about the divorce. We found court records showing Miguel Sauceda had filed for divorce from his wife last October. But before the legal system could sort it all out, police believe he chose to end it all in this violent way. They say their investigation is continuing. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Also new at five, the concrete truck driver in that deadly crash with a school bus in Bastrop County has been charged. According to Bastrop County court documents, Jerry Hernandez is charged with criminally negligent homicide. This comes just one day after police records revealed Hernandez admitted to doing cocaine on the morning of the crash. He also admitted he smoked marijuana the night before. Hernandez is accused of driving the truck into the school bus's lane on Highway 21. Bus camera video released just yesterday showing the moments before and after the crash. 
That bus was carrying 44 pre-K students from a Hayes Consolidated ISD campus along with 11 adults. They were returning from a field trip. Two people died, including a five-year-old. A school district spokesperson says the school bus did not have seat belts. The Department of Public Safety is still investigating. A man accused of speeding away from a fatal hit and run crash on the northwest side almost two years ago has finally been arrested. SAPD says Kenneth Arthur Relitz is charged with collision involving death. The fatal hit and run happened in September 2022. Investigators say he was behind the wheel of a car that hit Jeffrey Schaefer as he was riding a bicycle on Culebra near Grissom Road, but didn't stop to help. The following day, police found the suspect's car abandoned less than half a mile away from the crash site. They say that car had been reported stolen, blood discovered inside a vehicle was tested, and police say that DNA matched relics. Bear County Sheriff's deputies want to know if you know this man. They say he walked up to a front door and kicked his way inside while armed with a gun. Deputies posting this home surveillance video on the Sheriff's Office Facebook page. They say this happened a little more than a week ago in the 10,100 block of Emerald Sun in West Bear County. Deputies say the man dressed in black kicked in the door in broad daylight. Once inside, the video shows him with a gun in his hand walking through the house. Deputies say after several minutes he left. Fortunately, no one was home at the time. It is unclear if he took anything from the residents. The sheriff's office is asking anyone who knows who this man is or where deputies can find him to call 210-335-6000. You do not have to give your name. As President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump gear up for a 2020 rematch this November, the cash in their campaign funds will be key. Biden put on a show of democratic unity at an event in Manhattan with ex-presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama just last night. The campaign says the fundraiser broke a record. Our Washington correspondent Julia Benbrook joins us live with how fundraising efforts could play a critical role in the election. Julia. Well, we know that money matters when it comes to a presidential campaign, and the Biden campaign just hosted the most successful single political fundraiser in terms of dollars raised. But according to sources familiar with the matter, the Trump team predicts that they will be able to top that record with an event next weekend. In a sign of democratic unity, former presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama participated in a fundraising event Thursday night where they took aim at President Joe Biden's opponent, another former president, Donald Trump. All the things he's doing are so old. Speaking of old. The Biden campaign excluded press and network cameras from the star-studded fundraiser and have released only selected clips. The event brought in more than $26 million, making it the most successful single political fundraiser in terms of dollars raised. Big symbolic win for Biden, and it comes at a good moment for him. Former President Donald Trump's campaign hopes to top Biden's record next week. Sources familiar with the matter say they are expecting to raise at least $33 million at an April 6th event in Palm Beach. Trump has recently taken on some unique business ventures, promoting shoes, perfume, and a Bible that includes the text of the Declaration of Independence and other historical documents. The website promoting the God Bless the USA Bible states that it is not political and no proceeds from the sales will go toward Trump's campaign saying the venture isn't owned, controlled, or managed by Trump. It is just paid to use his name and image. No mention if any money will go toward Trump's legal troubles. When it comes to cash on hand, the Biden campaign has the advantage. Biden ended February with 71 million in available cash in his primary campaign account. That's more than twice the 33.5 million in cash reserves held by the Trump campaign. Reporting live at the White House, Julia Benbrook, KSAT 12 News. Julia, will you talk to us about what we know about Donald Trump's fundraiser next weekend? Well, we're still learning, but 
we have learned that sources familiar with the matter predict that they could raise about 33 million at this fundraiser. It's taking place on April 6th in Palm Beach. And it's going to be a chance to see if some of these GOP donors that have really stayed out of the race so far or even endorsed other primary candidates, if they're going to step up and come together here. On the invitation, there were some special guests listed, including North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, and entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy. All of them were in the primary race against Trump and then turned around and endorsed him. It's also notable that several of those names are being floated around when there's talk about who could be Trump's running mate. Tickets for the event are starting around $250,000 and going all the way up above $800,000. Julia Benberg reporting live for us from Washington. Thanks, Julia. The Passion of the Christ drawing a crowd to downtown this Good Friday as actors depicted the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus. It's a Holy Week tradition here in San Antonio as many Christians prepare to celebrate Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. The procession starting this year at Travis Park. Parishioners from San Fernando Cathedral reenacted the Passion. Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sear explaining Christ showed his love for the world by dying on the cross. We asked a couple of folks what the passion means to them and why they came to watch. To see Jesus uh, like die for our sins for us to have eternal life. My mom brought me when I was little to always remember what he did. Um, and I wanted to bring my kids so that they can remember too in this Easter season what, what he did for us. The San Antonio Passion Play dates back to 1983. And of course, today is Good Friday and this weekend is Easter. After staking their claim, campers showed up to local parks last night. The city lifted the curfew at several local parks. That curfew goes back into place on Sunday. Now, in addition to camping out, there's a lot to do this Easter weekend, including egg hunts. Scan the QR code on your screen to get all the details. That code taking you directly to the things to do section on KSAT.com. That's a good day for a nice fish fry if you can. 59 degrees earlier this morning, 81 this afternoon, a decent amount of clouds overhead, but overall uh, no rain or anything falling from those clouds and we don't have any chances of rain in the forecast till early next week. We'll get to that in a moment. 83 Eagle Pass, Floresville, 81 in Michael's backyard. We've got 78 in Bulverde, 79 right now in New Braunfels and a bit breezy. You notice that wind throughout the day today, the Branches were swaying a little bit, nothing overwhelming, but we will still have wind gusts between 20 and 30 miles per hour through the night tonight and even into tomorrow uh, as well. As for the temperatures, 73 at 8 o'clock, by 10 o'clock we're 68, midnight at 64, not as much of a temperature drop tonight as previous nights. We've got higher humidity, spring-like temperatures, a spring-like feel, but just for a few days. We'll talk about our next cold front in a bit. Thanks a lot, Adam. Taking a look outside at Transguide. We're at Interstate 10 at Callahan West. Things moving pretty smoothly there on the right. Not so much the story on the left as you try and make your way along Interstate 10 on this Friday evening. Uh, nothing better than being on the right. Perhaps nothing worse than being on the left as you try and either make that commute home or start to take that trip out of town for Easter weekend. And coming up after the break, if you're looking to buy or sell, Facebook Marketplace can be an easy way to accomplish both. And so can becoming a victim. How to avoid scammers who are in the market to steal more than just your money. I'm Myra Arthur here in the newsroom, and here's what we're working on for the news at 6 o'clock today. The union representing San Antonio firefighters wants to get a big payday for its members. The union and city now negotiating to try to hammer out a new contract. But why do union members seem to be playing coy on how much they actually want? Garrett Berger looks into that. Plus, a nonprofit aimed at honoring first responders, fallen first responders rather, is in town to do just that for the San Antonio Police Department. But there's a problem. They plan to build honor chairs for two SAPD officers. That work is now on hold after their work truck with supplies was broken into. Coming up, the founder of the organization takes us through this big setback. That and more today on the News at 6.
Well, it's a no-brainer. You can save money by buying secondhand goods. And with Facebook Marketplace, it's easy to find all sorts of things at a bargain price. But that's not all you can find. Con artists are scrolling and listing things as well. So 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz has some ways to keep it safe. You name it, you can probably buy it from folks on Facebook. I actually have bought a car on Facebook Marketplace. Buying a car from a stranger may not typically be recommended, but Michelle Concha had done her homework. Because we had people in common in the area that I felt actually more secure about buying the car from that person. You can get a good deal using social media, but... You can also get scammed. People have lost more than $2.7 billion to social media scams since 2021. Some scammers lurking on Facebook Marketplace aren't after your money, though. They want your data. Just last weekend, I posted some furniture for sale on Facebook Marketplace. Within minutes, I had four eager buyers, but what they all wanted was for me to text them. They were obviously fake. So here are some tips from Consumer Reports. Never share personal info like your address, email, or phone number. Only communicate through Facebook Messenger. Second, meet in a public well-lit area. Consider a police substation. Number three, don't use cash. Facebook Marketplace recommends a secure person-to-person -person payment method. Even then, you need to be careful. You always want to make sure that you're sending money to the right person before you send the full amount. So here's one tip. Send a $1 test payment first and then make sure that that person received it. For big money purchases like that car Michelle bought, pay the old-fashioned way and get a cashier's check. It's peace of mind protecting your purchase and your safety. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Some helpful tips for you today. Let's go ahead and look outside. You can see lots of clouds in the sky. A uh, nice warm day as we head into Easter weekend. But Adam Kasky, you were telling us the humidity is coming in at some point. It is. I know we've uh, many people have had their windows open or windows down in the vehicles, but uh, the humidity is coming back and you'll feel that there's going to be more of a spring like feel in the days ahead through the weekend and even Monday. Then a cold front arrives Monday night. That's going to change everything and we will drop a little cool cooler than average for the middle part of the week. Let's get right to it. Don't put the jackets away just yet. You don't need them this weekend, but next week you will. At the bus stop Wednesday morning, we're back down in the mid 40s. Same with Thursday morning. Now here's one of the big changes coming our way. Dew points right now, not all that high in the upper 50s, but overnight tonight they're climbing into the low 60s, which means you'll feel the mugginess later tonight and first thing tomorrow morning. Whenever that dew point is 60 or above, you feel a bit of humidity in the air. Then by Sunday, it just keeps rising into the mid 60s. And then Monday, we're almost at the oppressive levels of humidity with dew points back up near 70 degrees on Monday. So the type of humidity we haven't felt a whole lot of recently. It doesn't last long, though. That spring like feel is gone for Tuesday. That Monday night cold front changes everything. We talked about the morning temperature change. Afternoons will be affected as well. As for tomorrow, 61 in the morning, some areas of fog and low clouds early, and then afternoon sunshine, humid. It may be fairly gray during parts of the day, but it's not going to rain. It may look like it could rain, but no showers. 81 degrees, the high temperature. That's in San Antonio, Poteet Pleasanton, 83, Kerrville, Ingram, 79 the high. We get into Easter Sunday, and I do think we'll have some morning dampness just in the form of fog and a little bit of mist, but no real rain, just that little hint of dampness in the air and very humid, mostly cloudy. Temperatures in the mid 80s, Easter Sunday, we're up to 87 on Monday. That's 10 degrees above average, but then the cold front arrives and temperatures fall back off. We have the mornings in the 40s, Wednesday and Thursday and afternoons, only in the lower 70s, so back below average. We still haven't said goodbye to all the uh, transitions here as we go into late spring and summer. Notice our beautiful pinwheel swirl here in the clouds and rain just west of California. That's a upper level disturbance that's slowly gonna work its way toward us and bring us our next shot of rain. Just don't get excited, unfortunately. It's looking pretty slim and measly again. We'll be right on the end of a thin line of showers and a few storms that develop Monday night. 
around midnight, give or take, and it's only at a 20 to 30 percent chance. Right now we've got it at that 20 percent chance. Next week, a lot of sunshine. You can open up the windows again, but keep in mind, it's still oak season. And oak is at over 8,000 today. It's high. Thanks a lot, Adam. Mary in with sports now. Spurs on a winning streak. That feels good to say. We haven't been able to say that a lot. I know, and tonight they can make it three straight. Against the New York Knicks, it's not going to be an easy fight, though. We'll preview that matchup coming up. Plus, an inside look at UTSA's position battle for the starting quarterback role after the break. This era is over, which means right now during spring camp, head coach Jeff Trailer is tasked with deciding who will be the next starting quarterback to lead the UTSA football program. The QB1 battle is between redshirt junior Eddie Lee Marburger and redshirt sophomore Owen McCown. Both played a little bit last year. Marburger played in two games against Army and Tennessee, both losses, and McCown was victorious in UTSA's bowl game. Trailer says the two signal callers are equally talented and he wouldn't be surprised if both of them played next season. A great competition. I mean, both those kids have gone back and forth with each other. It's, it's, it's a blessing because they both, they're about the right stuff. They come from good families. They're about the road runners. And they, they take care of each other. Whole room's that way. I mean, Jackson and Brandon are having a nice little battle for the third spot down there. So it's it's pretty cool watching that. Uh, we rotate them where Owen goes to the ones some and Eddie goes to the ones some. And we just keep flipping that thing around. Well, it's a good battle. All right, the San Antonio Spurs have rattled off back to back wins here in late March and are making are looking to make it three straight with the New York Knicks in town tonight. The Knicks enter the day sitting in third in the East and like many teams, the Spurs have faced as of late, New York is trying to better their playoff seating, but San Antonio is just as motivated to play spoiler, and they're coming in with confidence after big wins against the Suns and Jazz. When you play like that against, especially against Phoenix, which is a team that is built for a championship, you know, then you kind of you kind of get excited because I think that you know we kind of re realizing what we're capable of doing. Um, so that's why I, I really feel comfortable with this team. And uh, you know, if I think that if season would start tonight from the beginning, I think that we would be in a much different situation than we are right now. But uh, you know, uh, it is what it is, and I think that this was a you know in terms of experience a great year for for us. And you know, we have a couple of games left, so we're gonna try and uh, win them all. Well, we should expect the 44 and 28 Knicks to be up for the challenge. Tip-off is at 7 o'clock. Should be a good one based on how the Spurs have been playing. Yeah, uh, potential three-game winning streak. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't have believed that a month ago. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> we'll be right back.